Hello, everyone. I am Jim Elizondo from Real Wealth Ranching, where our goal is that you have your maximum profitability while improving your land the fastest. To achieve this, we need fat cows. So my mantra is fat cows, fat cows, fat cows. Fat cows are so important because a fat cow can give you profits, while a thin cow will only give you pity. I also like another saying that goes like this. When you get fat roots in your forest plants, you will get fat land, which means high humus soil, which will allow you to have fat cows, which is properly managed and marketed, you will have a fat wallet. So that's why we call it the fat wallet ranchers. So today we're going to talk about the importance of a complete grazing, which is part of our total grazing program. Why is this so important? Uh, it's so important because then we can improve or increase our carrying capacity and improve our land at the same time. And this goes against what we have been taught. Common knowledge has it that the more you leave behind, the better. Somehow, nobody explains how, magic happens and that extra residual left behind. produces more leaves in the next regroup. What we're going to see is that that is not what happens. What happens is that too much residual left behind will create problems that we're going to about to see. Okay, so I'm going to start the presentation and the explanation. And at the end, I would love to answer your questions that I'm sure you will have. Thank you very much. Okay, as I was saying, my name is Jim Elizondo, and I am the creator of Real Wealth Ranching. I am a real rancher with over 30 years of experience in regenerating the land and significantly improving profits on my own ranches and with my consulting clients on many different environments. My passion is to help ranchers to achieve the same. If you're an ambitious farmer or rancher who's looking to maximize your profitability while improving your land the fastest, you are in the right place. So let's get started. I have a question for you. Have you already implemented the total grazing program? This doesn't mean if you have taken my courses, as I have some people, with good results who have used what I have published online. I've been in the regenerative space for a long time, long enough to know that there might be a few factors holding you back from diving headfirst into total grazing, and I get it. But after more than 30 years in the ranching business, I can truly say that total grazing is the number one thing that has catapulted me and my ranches to a level of success I could never ever have imagined. And the same goes for so many of my students. With that, I want to take a little bit of your precious time to share the most common myths about total grazing that I hear all the time. If you dream of being a successful rancher or farmer and you want maximum profitability, peace of mind, knowing and observing that your grass and land is improving every year, then this live session is going to get you fired up. Let me say it again. You're going to walk away from today's live session fired up and ready to start implementing total grazing. Because guess what? Once you do, you'll never look back or wish you could just get ahead and make this whole real wealth in your ranch really work. And I genuinely want that for you. So stick with me. Trust me. You don't want to miss this as I debunk the most common myth about total grazing. And I have a sneaky feeling that you have fallen for it. That's okay. We're going to dive into it, so let's get started. 
The most common myth is that total grazing does not leave enough residual behind to protect the soil surface from temperatures extremes. So let's kick this off. I'm going to be upfront about it. We do not focus on leaving residual when we finish with a complete or non-selective grazing. Here's the thing. If we focus for what we want, and what we want is a high utilization and good, strong, fat roots, which in turn produce a healthy soil due to its root exudates, then we eliminate so many problems. Anytime there is not a complete grazing, you end up with selective grazing. They are, selective grazing is called in many ways, grazing the top third, the top half, mop grazing, etc. And because selective grazing has long been promoted, promoted, and by selective grazing, I mean those I mentioned, anywhere where there is not a complete grazing is selective grazing, meaning that the cow selects what they graze and oh my, how they are picky. Now, if you haven't taken the time to notice this, do not worry. But back to what I was referring to. Because selective grazing has long been promoted, ranchers and farmers have been convinced to leave a lot of residual after grazing. And by residual, I mean leaving two thirds of the grass, leaving litter, residual, or however you want to call it. Somebody, someone call it mulch. Basically, leaving what the cow didn't graze, a large portion of what was originally available. Some think that the residue protects the soil from erosion caused by water or wind. Others think that the residue protects the soil from the sun and high temperatures. And others think that the residue protects the soil from low temperatures. So what is residual? Let's remember what residue or residual is. It is what the cattle did not want to graze what they rejected. So what is it composed of? Well, uh, mostly non-desirable plants, brown leaves, and stems, or like one of my students said the other day, sticks and stones. Because what do cow prefer to graze? The green leaves and the desirable plants. In fact, because you return faster to regrade when you do top grazing, which by the way is selective grazing, guess what the cow is going to select when she comes back? Well, she's going to select the poor little desirable plants that are barely regrowing, are very tender, but by grazing them again too soon, they will be killed. And the non-desirable species will continue to thrive. And eventually, you will get a shift of species in your land to more undesirable species as a percentage. So this is what I mean, that if we focus on what we actually want, which is a high utilization and strong roots, we can avoid this problem and so many others. Now, let me ask you a question. What is going to protect the soil better? Stick and stones or a well-covered soil with, with strong, fat roots? What helps to avoid erosion? The answer is simple. Strong and fat roots and more growing points per square yard. Okay, so how can we achieve that? Enter the total grazing program. As I explained in the previous podcast and in other videos and blogs, under the total grazing program, you do a complete grazing most of the time. You graze it all, and we follow with a long rest period because we come back much slower. We actually do selective grazing, but only at certain times, like when it's muddy and during the calving season, which is very short, and finally, we stockpile in area. Plus, we alternate those areas. So total grazing is made up of a complete grazing most of the time, 
selective grazing just for a few instances and stockpiling in area. So let's say that you are in the complete grazing phase and you finish grazing, taking all the leaves and stems. How does the ground look like? Well, depending on what is the state that you are starting off, you will see a well-covered ground with no spaces between plants, but with not much leaves and stems. By the way, there should be no bare soil. If you are leaving much bare soil, then that is not total grazing, sorry. It should look like in the picture. This means that we leave enough residue to cover the soil from extreme temperatures and the sun. But more importantly, it leaves what actually protects the soil, which is the number of plants or growing points per square yard. What do I mean by this? Well, no spaces in between the plants Imagine you are looking down into the ground after doing a complete grazing of a heavy yielding pasture. You will be able to see the closeness of your forest growing points and plant crowns from where new leaves will be produced. It is this closeness of your best species growing points that ensures you have a mat of strong and fat roots to achieve a full solar panel once regrowth commences. It also means high soil life, which keeps your soil where it should be by preventing erosion thanks to the many intertwined roots. And plants with thick and strong roots that are achieved by following the total grazing program. By having more desirable plants per square yard, we can take better advantage of sunlight with a much larger solar panel in order not only to feed our livestock, but also to feed the soil life with the root exudates that the plant releases around its roots to feed the microorganisms that in turn make nutrients available to the plant. Friends, this is how the relationship of the plant with the soil life really works. It's a symbiosis where one depends on the other. And that's how the best soils in the world have been created with forest plants. So, to sum it up, after a complete grazing, we rotate much, much lower across the ranch or farm where the cows are taking off the leaves and the stems, and we are allowing the plant to store enough energy in the root reserves before we come back. So this means that you have a good solar panel, you have more growing points, the desirable plants are not killed off. In fact, they grow much stronger and take over the competition. And you start seeing more and more of them. I am so passionate about this because I have seen the results with so many of my students that I am hoping that if you are at a, at a stage that you are ready to understand this, you can grasp it. We must also emphasize that just as the cow needs the grass, the grass needs the plant. I mean, no, just as the cows need the grass, the, the, the grass needs the cow. And this is so because the growth points or buds and the new seedlings of the best species in our fields require sunlight to not die. Lack of sunlight will kill them. When top grazing or selective grazing is done and a lot of stem or residue is left behind, these new seedlings and growing points do not receive enough sunlight and die or stunt their growth. Imagine a paddock with too many stems left behind, too much residual in the ground. This doesn't allow sunlight to reach the growing points or the seedlings, and you get old or overmature forage and a lot a lot of stems. This also means the energy in your forest diminishes. So there is a point where excess residue can be harmful to your grass, and there is a point where a lack of residue can leave bald soil. 
Under the total grazing program, you achieve high harvest efficiency and you do not leave the soil bare. In reality, the residual must be a byproduct of a pro complete grazing, since it depends on the amount of forage present before grazing, which in turn is determined by maturity, growing conditions, strong and fat roots, and more especially the humus content of your soil. Humus, by the way, is a stable fraction of organic matter that cannot be degraded further by action of microorganisms. If you have followed me for a while now, you know that I talk about humus all the time, and I am so passionate about it. If this is the first time you hear about this, check out my YouTube channel or blog under the name Real Wealth Ranching. Now, coming back. Under total grazing, we have a high harvest efficiency and many times this scares ranchers or farmers. And I get it. it if it scares you because you were taught to only take 30%, then for sure, this is going to be a big change, but let me walk you through it. Under total grazing, we do complete grazing. So I am not talking about the stockpiling, stockpiling in area, which is alternated, nor the selective grazing when it's muddy or in calving season. I think I need to stress that out because no, we do not do a complete grazing all the time in all the farm or ranch the whole year. I think that is what most ranchers and farmers have been mistakenly taught. With the complete grazing that we do most of the time, not all, we normally achieve a very high harvest efficiency. How high? We normally achieve, uh, are you ready for this? 80 to 90% harvest efficiency with our cattle. And I can almost read your mind. Oh, whoa, isn't that just leaving the soil bare? As I have mentioned, no, the ground is not bare. It is well covered and please go to my Instagram or YouTube channel so that you can see it for yourself. Here are a few examples. This is ball clover in Katy, Texas. No-till drilled over Bermuda grass and Bahia grass. This is Bahia grass in North Central Florida. And this is stockpiled and frozen Bermuda grass in Katy, Texas. Notice that the cows are in good body condition, keeping with what I said when we started. Fat cows, fat cows, fat cows. That is so important. So if we harvest 80 to 90% of what was there, that means that we leave 10 to 20% of the forage that was there before grazing as residual. It is important to remember that the greater the amount of forage before grazing, the greater the amount of residual, as it is a percentage of what was there before grazing. This means that the more forage we produce, the more is left as residual to cover the soil. But please, please do not try to leave more residual by doing top third grazing, top half, mop grazing. I mean, at the end, all of this do selective grazing because it will lead to several unwanted consequences. I love examples because it really paints the picture of what I am trying to communicate. So imagine this, you have your cattle grazing in a field that has 4,000 kilos of grass per hectare. You can substitute this for 
pounds per acre. They graze and they will leave only 800 kilos of residual or mulch on the ground, which is the 20% residual that you will get with the total grazing. But when the amount of forage is increased thanks to the longer rest time that a complete grazing allows or affords, let's say at 10,000 kilos of grass per hectare, then the residual would be 2,000 kilos, which is much more and without having to manage specifically to leave more residual when doing top grazing, which has, at the end is selective grazing. Why do I say so much selective grazing? Because cattle do not graze like a lawnmower. They take some plants that they really like down to the ground and leave others untouched. And this is very important because the ones that will disappear from your land or pasture will be your best species. So when the rancher tries to leave more residual or more mulch after grazing a field, they incur in top or selective grazing by trying to have the cattle trample more and consume less. Would you do that when harvesting corn or soybeans? I mean, this is not only wasteful, but it goes against profitability. And not only that, it also goes against how nature works where many and diverse species of herbivores under the predator effect resulted in a complete grazing. So you can have more forage produced in your ranch and you can come back much slower, giving a longer rest period to build fat roots. And by having a complete grazing, you can have a good residual at the same time, but as a byproduct. Remember, total grazing does not incur in bare soil or unprotected soil. It is actually the opposite. It is how you're going to protect your soil and regenerate it with strong fat roots and good rest. As I say, as the cow needs the grass, the grass needs the cow. Imagine the possibilities. A better solar panel coming back much, much slower to regraze the plant that now will be full of energy reserves, good body condition in your cattle, more and better desirable species. I mean, this sounds like a dream, but those are the results and it is a reality. So start by saying yes and join the weekly podcast and online course waitlist. Go to www.rwranching.com slash join. Now let's start with the questions. Hey, hello. I, I'm sorry I didn't uh, say hello to many of you. Simon Kellett, hello, nice to, to see you here. Cecilia Felicia Granados, hello. Uh, 21st Century Homestead, hello. Adam Rabjones, Rab hello from Australia, nice. And Matt Robbins, hello. Uh, Amy Picker has a, a question. I'm going to put it here so we can all see it. Are, are the recommendations for grazing the same if we are starting with land that has a larger interplant spacing? I know over time, I'm going to put it again. I know over time with proper management, there will be more growing points per square yard. yard. But right now, there are some places with six to eight inches between bunch grasses. That's a very good question, Amy. And reminds me when I started regenerating the worst land I have ever regenerated, which was in North Central Florida, sandy soil with 1% organic matter. And the plants were few and far in between. What we had the most of was uh, dog fennel, which is, can be poisonous. So I had to decide, what do I do? There are feet in between plants. I mean, some places were on the bare sand. But I know, and I knew back then, that the best treatment that you can give to a forest grass 
by Bahia grass in that instance is to completely graze it off, which will give you a longer rest period to give it a chance to recover its energy reserves by then. If you do on the top grazing, you have to return faster. And a stocking rate, the number of productive animals you can keep per ranch or farm per year at a low cost determines profitability. I knew I didn't want to feed hay and I had too many cows for such degraded land. So by applying these principles that I've been talking about, the total grazing program with the complete grazing, in six years, that land was uh, four times more productive and the organic matter had gone from 1% to 3.18%. So I can tell you that I am sure that it works doing it this way instead of trying to leave more behind. Uh, oh, Adam Raff John says, Amy, Amy, yes, it's, it is still the same. You can look into receding the very bare areas. The animal impact from total grazing will also help seeds already in the seed bank to germinate naturally. Totally correct. And that's what we got. Now, 21st century homestead. What's what are your thoughts on grazing cattle with other animals, chicken, sheep, etc.? That's a good question. Also, I love multi-species grazing, chickens, even pigs, and a lot, a sheep and goats with cows and horses. You know why we need horses? Because horses can thrive on lower or poor quality left behind stems than the cows cannot do well with because they are hind gut fermenters, like we had long time ago, the big mammals that are extinct now. So if you go to the Serengeti Park in Africa, you will see all these different types of herbivores together. So if you can do it, if you can make it pencil out in your manpower or labor that you need to put in to do that, then absolutely do it. It's, it I think that's the best way to do it, yes. Uh, Andy Bonnie. Hi, Jim. I am in New Zealand. I have used and come and come set, oh, set stock hoggets and trade cattle are on a rotation, but getting short. It's almost spring where we normally get great growth, but the armor on the soil is disappearing. Hmm. Wonder why. Uh, I'm sure you're coming back too soon. So in total grazing, we do complete grazing like you do, but we do not come back so soon. And you are in a cool season environment, cool season grass environment, and by coming back too soon, you maintain very high protein and energy, but you also deplete your roots of energy reserves. And remember, I talked a lot about fat and strong roots, which is the real armor of your soil. So uh, when you focus on that, you will get much better results. Would you sell or write it out? Hmm. I would, uh, your uh, early spring, I would, um, if you do not have any stored forages, I will have but I will have decided this long time ago in the total grazing program, we have, we monitor our stockpile and we know exactly how many days we have left. When you measure the sword in the whole property, that is very hard to do. So you know better your land than I do. I do not know exactly how many days you have left of forage and how many days it will take for it to grow back to the appropriate land that I would recommend from New Zealand. I, because uh, what's happening there is overgrazing and that's bad for the plant, but you usually have a very good weather. So you may want to risk it. I, I, I don't know without knowing more of that. Uh, I know that when you have a, if you're in the North Island, if you have a, a month of no rain is a drought, 
And that's because of the shortness of the roots of the forest plants that you manage. We need to change that. We need stronger roots, deeper roots, and more plants per square yard. Now, you already have that, but you do not have the strong and deep roots. Brindisi, oh, you're welcome. 21st century homestead says, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Brindisi Corso. What is the minimum and maximum time should we be trying to obtain for an area for it to be complete grazed? Hours, days, I am trying to determine the area versus the stocking density. Yeah, you're, you're going to learn uh, in the total grazing program that we want them to consume everything before they dung and fowl with their manure and urine, the forage. So we want them to finish it in two hours maximum. We move them in uh, on average, this is uh, optimal. We move them on average every two hours, four times a day. Now you can do it with a lower harvest efficiency, a little lower, and not as good results. But you can do it with one at one move per day also. So you need to juggle it and play with it to find the best approach for your land and your time. Matt Crane. Larger or smaller, tighter paddocks, or according to the forage quality. And we have done total grazing on winter killed warm season. I'm in Western North Carolina, very high rainfall, 80 plus inches a year, some fescue and warm season like crab and dallas grass. Dallas grass is a very good grass for your environment. Let me go back. And uh, crabgrass is a good annual, very low fiber, high quality. So, uh, as I said, you should look to have your animal finish everything off before two hours have elapsed in that fresh break. And that's what we teach in the total grazing program. Because we do not want only to have a high harvest efficiency. We want to have fat cows, and it comes together in the program. And congratulations on that good rainfall. I'm sure you have tall fescue, and those go very, very well. I've been there. Go very well with your warm season Dallas grass. Melanie Burkhardt. I heard feeding some sulfur mineral will help with pink eye. What are your feelings on feeding sulfur? Mm. Yeah, for more details, you can go to the Total Grazing Plus on uh, wait list, the course. That, that There will be all the details there. Now, about the sulfur mineral. I, I do not like to feed something uh, for feed a mineral element because it will impact the availability of others. So I prefer, yes, you can put the sulfur out there, but along with the other different element minerals, each one in its own compartment. Because if they require sulfur, they will consume sulfur. Too much sulfur will impact or inhibit the uh, uptake of selenium, amongst other things, phosphorus. If you do not have enough phosphorus, you will not have shiny coats. If you do not have shiny coats, fertility will suffer because phosphorus is essential for ATP formation which is the field for the cells, adenosine triphosphate. I don't know where am I? Oh, Matt Crane. Oh, and have a large pasture stockpile with a lot of nut sedge. Okay, nut sedge comes up when you have too much rain or you have um, a hard pan. So check for a hard pan. I explain how to do that in the course. Uh, Brindisi Corazon, how are you managing water and shade? Is it provided in each area or is it acceptable to have a central area for the cattle to return to those? We have some areas, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> with very steep slopes and provided water and shade in those areas is difficult. Yeah, don't worry about it. What you want is to have the cattle laying down 
where you're going to give them the next paddock. Why is this so important? They can go to water. Ideally, I want shade in a savanna type effect in the whole pasture. I do recommend planting shade trees in rows by seed every 100 feet at the least, rows east to west. So you have shade, but the water, they can walk, they can walk to water and then they come back and they will be waiting there for you to give them the fresh break. In my case, I use four breaks per day on average, and that's what has worked the best. Jenny Christian. Oh, Christison. What's the best way to increase to a larger herd after total grazing starts working? Well, you just add animals. Uh, if you need to buy animals, that will be explained in the online course, and there is a, a wait list that you can sign up and, and that I will tell you the very best way to build up a herd of fertile females by doing those, taking those steps. Uh, BG Thompson's, Thompson, hi Jim, I'm in South Georgia. Oh, good, I like that area. I have bahia grass that I am trying to stockpile. What have you found is best to supplement for protein in winter? The very best for me is high quality alfalfa hay, horse quality alfalfa hay. But sometimes it's expensive and I understand that. And you can use other sources like 41% uh, cow cubes that are made out of cotton seed meal. And that you can fit on the ground in your fields. And that's what I was using in Tallahassee, Florida with good results. Uh, for more details, you can join the waitlist and we will let you know as soon as enrollment opens. There is the, the, uh, the link. Sorry. I am trying to read and think many things at the same time. In regards to phenotype versus genotype, do you believe it is possible to select a British breed, let's say a Black Angus, and then use the selection guidelines to achieve a beef herd that has high utilization. Yes, depending on your environment, it, that may be the best approach. For example, in Scotland, I have students that are doing that with great success. In the Chihuahua Mountains, with uh, over 6,000 feet up in very dry country, uh, an almost pure Angus breed does well. In other areas, they do not. So it depends on environment. Sometimes we need more uh, adapted genes to cross with the Angus so we can create a much better animal. And the details will be shown here. We're going to talk about it, how to form your own composite. Composite, so you have much higher productivity per acre per year at a lower cost and a much better animal, which you can eventually sell genetics from. So I believe that's the ultimate goal we should all strive for. Oh, okay. Here is uh, Simon, Simon Kelly. I am in a mild subtropical environment with mainly C4 grasses. Well, you see, Angus comes from Scotland and England, where they have cool season grasses. It's never too hot. It does get cold. So uh, a pure Angus may not be your best fit, but we will talk about that in detail and in depth in the Total Grazing Plus online course. And you can sign up here. And then uh, you will be able to ask those special questions that need to be answered. Ramiro Barrera. Hello, Jaime. I really enjoyed your talks and videos. Half of my ranch is located in a lagoon that has that is filled up for about two to three months of the year with water. What grasses would you recommend that tolerate clay soils that are covered with water two to three months of the year? My ranch is located in southwest, southeastern New Mexico, near the border, and I usually average less than 10 inches a year. 
very interesting question. You do not mention soil salinity, but I will assume that you do have it. So maybe what is going to grow there or is already growing is sacaton alcalino, alkali grass, alkali sacaton, which is very fibrous, very hard, low palatability, and you do need nutritional adaptation. It will be wise you get to the to the course, you sign up, because then we will talk about specifically what you need for such an environment. I have I have witnessed uh, people on the other side of that border in Mexico doing this with uh, adapted composite that they had built, and that's the best way to do it. They have used the Mashona. There are other breeds that can be used along with the Angus or Brangus in that case. Simon Kelly, are there practical tips for achieving high forage utilization with conventional cattle? Will more frequent moves make a real impact or is it really a case of additional supplements? That's a good question, Simon. Simon. When you do not change your genetics to adapt to your environment and you try to change your environment to adapt to your genetics by feeding more supplements, you're going to lose money. It's simple as that. Nature always bats last, and nature has deeper pockets than any of us. So it's like pushing on a string. You get nowhere. You can do it by supplying more and better supplements and moving them up to four times a day. That will improve it to the maximum. But you will still need to, to uh, change your genetics. Create a composite. Don't be shy. Get your name on our wait list. You will never regret it. I, I, that I can assure you. Okay. Ramiro Salena, Barrera y Salin, yeah. Yeah, because I've been on ranches on the other side of the border in Chihuahua, and they are Salin. So it will be Zacatón Alcalino until it recovers, and then it may change to better species as I have witnessed. But first you need to do the, the homework. Uh, Ram Ramiro says, uh, thank you. You're welcome, more surely. Uh, Melanie Burkhardt, I have been total grazing for three years and now need more cows. I know you do not like that. So is it okay to keep heifers that are not really what I want to increase my numbers, what would you do, Lenny? Hello, Lenny. Absolutely. I would leave all my heifers because we do not know if they will be good for that environment or not until we expose them to the bull, they get pregnant, they cap, and they then if they do not fail to reconcede, they are good for that ranch. Remember, number of cattle, productive cattle, determine profitability if carried at a low cost, which, which I'm sure you're doing. So try to grow up and build up your cow numbers. That's more important than having the best cows. The number one determinant of profitability in any ranch is the number of cattle you can carry per year at a low cost. After you achieve that high number of females, then you can start cooling the worst ones, but not before. Even having a, a, a calf every other year is better than nothing. If your cost, costs are low, do that until you improve your genetics. I really do not like that because I've been there, I've done that, and I had the, the scars to show. Uh, Simon Kelly, I am moving to Mashona Cross, but it is a process to get there. Absolutely. So as I just said, do the best with what you have. This means manage for their genetics. Keep them fat. Keep them productive. And later, when you have enough of the appropriate type of cattle, then you can start cooling, but not now. 
keep what you have and work with it. Unless they are absolutely failures, and there are some. If you have some absolute failures that do not have, do not conceive in any time, they need to go. Because you can make more money by having other people cattle in your land and charging a rent. You understand? You need to convert your what you produce, grass, into a saleable product or money. We need money. We need to make our family happy. So always remember that. 21st century homestead. I can wait for this course. Good vibes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will be so happy to have you there. Simon Kellett, do you have any tips on the impact of forage changes when rotating cattle onto paddocks that have different plant species? Yes. Do not do that. Try to have a lot of biodiversity in all the paddocks. Do not have one paddock for a different species than the other. Because the cows, when they change their diet in the rumen, these rumen microorganisms are at least four different types. Some of them will digest fiber, others protein, others starches, other oils. And if the diet is changing constantly, they will not be able to be efficient in digesting that forage. When a, di a diet changes, like from one species of forage to another, the rumen microorganisms can take from three to seven days to adjust. And that's why, that's one of the reasons that we have frequent moves. And I prefer not to change grass species when rotating. So, we, we will talk about that in the online course, which I hope that you by now are interested in joining the waitlist. I have found a real performance, a real drop in performance and forage utilization for several weeks from, when rotating onto native paddocks or pastures from the African type C4 grass. Yes, that's what I was just mentioning. So maybe keep two different rotations. Two, two different groups, one in one type of grass and the other in the other type of grass. That's what I can, a, a good suggestion I can give you now. Uh, Melanie Burkhardt, thank you. My neighbors are watching, Lenny. Yes, Lenny, the neighbors will watch, but guess what? They will not come to ask you. That's my experience. They will watch and maybe envy you, but they will be, uh, Maybe not ask you how you're doing it. If they do, then so good for them. You can help them. Simon Kellett, great, thanks. Yes, yes, yes. I am, I am so happy because I want you to be su successful. I want you to have this for you, your land, your family, your cattle. I want you to have harmony. Every decision and action we take today will impact or have a consequence in the short, the mid, and the long term. So we need to be careful and we need to be thinking about all of that when we are uh, making decisions. That, that's what I would suggest. So I, I much prefer that you're always thinking in that mindset, short, mid, and long term. Why? Short term, we need fat cows. Yeah. So that's why I said what I said. Long term, we need fat land, high humus. So that's why we do a complete grazing followed by a long rest. Mid term, we need to have forage in our non growing season or difficult season. So that's why we do uh, stockpile areas also to keep fat cows in the growing season when it's green. We need to have them graze our best forage in the right stage it make it's no makes no sense to have thin cows when it's green so we can have more stockpile when it's brown we want fat cows when it's green so they need to be grazing at the appropriate stage and that's explained also in the course so um, i would like to know if you have any questions about this Facebook Live, about the residual, why are we not so intent or focusing 
on leaving more residual, but we are focusing on creating fat roots with closer growing points and more plants with more leaves per square yard. That's our goal. When we go for that goal, the rest of the problems start to fade away. And that's what I want you to take from this class or from this talk. Focus on what you want, not on what you do not want. When we focus on what we do not want, we end up doing what we do not want. When we focus on what we want, the so-called problems cease to be a problem because you are intent on what you want to achieve. Try to achieve always strong and fat roots and very close interplant spacings with more leaves and less stems. And you will go further forward than with any other type of decision you make today. Here is another question. Uh, Cecilia Felicia Granados Cordero. Do you have reference of farms in the hum on the humid tropics region like Costa Rica? Yes. Uh, in Colombia, there are some that are doing it in hilly country like Costa Rica with uh, 2,600 millimeters of rainfall per year. And they are having good success, but they did have to select differently their cattle than they were doing before. On my family ranch, they get from 1,200 millimeters to 1,500, depending on hurricane season. And uh, they are having great success also by doing all, all of this. So yes, I do have experience in Maui, uh, Hawaii, also with high rainfall, good experience there. Yes. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. You're more, more, more. You're truly welcome. Thank you. That's very nice because you see the principles are the same anywhere you go. What changes is the application, the specifics of how to apply it. But the principles that the plant, for example, will grow better and more leaf when it has a fat root. That means a long enough rest period after grazing it off in a complete manner then you will get uh, much stronger roots, which will help you reduce or eliminate completely erosion by water or by wind and will protect the soil much better because guess what? The root exudates produce with the mycorrhiza in the soil. They produce glomalin. Glomalin is the, the glue that makes soil aggregates. And soil aggregates those little particles that are stuck together by this glue, slow down or completely inhibit erosion. So that's what we need. Litter, as we know, or residual, is taken away by the wind or the, or the water, and it will end in the, in the closest fence line. We need strong plants. That's why I say uh, fat roots, fat land, fat cows, fat wallet. They all come together. It's been very interesting answering your questions. I love it when I am asked questions that are real from people actually on the land that are observing and are having interaction with their animals. That's where we need to be. We need to have interaction with our animals, our plants, and bring harmony. We need harmony in our lives. And if you notice in nature, there is harmony. So we want to achieve that. Oh, 21st century homestead. How are the Machona as milking cows? They have a short lactation, but in the Chona people in Zimbabwe do milk them. Some of them have very nice others. But what I would suggest is that you contact Mr. Brown in the, in the Tennessee University. He's doing uh, for homestead cows. He's doing uh, 
Mashona with their the breed, what is this short breed black dexters with black dexters, and he's having great results. Uh, we sold him some uh, good Mashona bulls that were shorter because he wants shorter cows for a homestead. And I think that will be very interesting that you talk to him and you see the pictures and videos of those animals or you make a visit to them at the University of Tennessee. Yeah, very good question. I love it. There are so many things we can do with genetics and so many things we can do with create. We can be very creative when grazing created to achieve more cow days harvested per acre per year, higher carrying capacity at a low cost, and animals that will not need to be pampered, that will allow us to have leisure time with their family. As Simon Kellett, what about meat quality and meat to bone ratio? Of course, that's so important. I'm glad you brought it about. I have been selecting for uh, beef meat to bone ratio for since day one. Why? Because that's why we sell. We sell beef. We do not sell bones. Actually, when they buy cattle for a feed yard, they want big bone cattle because they are late maturing, which is the opposite of what we want in a ranch or a farm. We want early maturing animals because as the number of animals carried per year per ranch determines profitability for the polo ranch. What determines the profitability of a female of a cow is her fertility. Low or slow maturity goes against fertility. Early maturity or precociousness goes for fertility. So it's, that's a very good question. Now, Mashona and Mashona crosses have a very good uh, meat quality in eating when you eat it. And this was, um, there were some tests or trials done by the Texas A&M long time ago. You can find them on the AmericanMachona.com website. And they found out that it was the same sheer force to bite or to chew than the pure Angus with the crossbreds, half blood. So that's that's a good, a good question. Yeah. Uh, 21st century homestead. And Jim, thank you for your time. So appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm happy to have you here. Jenny Christian, Christison, Christis, Christison. Do you need to use a back fence when total grazing or not? Well, in the green season, yes, because if not, they're going to regraze the regrowth, which will be overgrazing. Overgrazing is when you return too soon to regrade the regrowth before it has fully recharged or rested completely to have its energy reserves or fat roots recharged. So yes, then you, you need to do it then. When it's the non-growing season, no problem. Uh, Miguel Molina, young growing animal seems to suffer more when total grazing. Any advice? Mm, depends if you are on cool season grasses, that should not be the case. If you're on warm season grasses, that could be the case. And that's why I suggest in my online course to do a, a modified leader follower system or to have them on a different rotation if you're on warm season grasses. It does it because of competition, more likely. Uh, we are close to University of Tennessee. We will try to see that Mashona De Dexter Cross, Lenny. Congratulations. I hope you like it. And Mr. Brown is a very nice man. You're going to like him. Uh, Simon Kellett, awesome. I have really enjoyed watching. Thank you very much, Simon. And Cecilia Felicia, thanks for your advice. Today we took a decision to stop milking. Wow. Wow, that's a big decision. We are struggling with workers, high costs, and poor condition of our Jersey cows. It is hard, but we need to reset and find that what we can do without affecting our family well-being. Well, depend, yeah, I, I, I fully understand you. And if it's such a big problem, you might want to change. I have a great dairy myself in the tropics. And I always told my wife that we were going to retire into beef cows because they are so much easier. But it's a decision you have to make with your calculator. 
and your lifestyle. Uh, David Comlander, I use a compaction meter to measure my soil. I can only go down one inch and on average before I hit 2,000 pounds of pressure. This limits oxygen getting into my soil for my microbes to live and work to perform. What's your recommendation to help with compaction? I always tell my students, uh, what do you have more to fix a problem or, uh, or carry out a project? Do you have more money or do you have more time? If you have more time, I would advise you to do it with biological methods, planting trees, planting a deep taproot legumes like um, sweet clover, and if, but if you have, if we wanted to do it faster or sooner, you can use a key line plow. You do it like every uh, three to four feet, and you do not over, do not turn the soil, invert the soil, but you just break the hard pan, and that will allow the roots to follow down and take liquid carbon or liquid sunlight with them down and increase humus in deeper uh, places. And this will uh, allow your forest production to double and triple if that's the problem, if it's not a pH problem. If it's a pH problem, then you need to correct that. But that only happens when it's below 5, 5.5 pH. Uh, Daniela Mars charts. Fence is working again. Are you almost done? Hello. Yes, we're almost done. Do you have a question? That will be the last question. Daniela? You can write it down there in the comment. Or if there is any other question before we part ways. Simon Kellett. I am currently reviewing my calving period and considering calving slightly later early summer. This will mean thought that I will be winning in the winter and trying to graze stockpile. Yes, that's not a problem with adapted cattle. That's what they do in ranches that I know of because I consulted for them in Chihuahua in the mountains where they do get snow. So they are calving their, their rains can come late, July, August, September, and that's the three months of rain. After that, it starts freezing in October. So they are always breeding in December and winning calves. Sometimes when it's too cold and drought and no rain because it's a 16 inch rainfall environment, they need to early win. So it does pay to have more cows, even if you need to early win, yes. With cows that are still lactating, any tips? Yes, you need appropriate genetics. You need to supplement a little protein if your grasses are C4 and below the 8% threshold. And you need to have the tool of early winning ready for if you need to do it. Well, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I'm going to leave you with, uh, well, we did go forward with this. And uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it today and hope you have a very good um, rest of the week. It's midway, midway there. And uh, hope to see you soon. Hope to see you next week, same time, in the next Facebook Live. I'll be here. I hope you can be here too. And we will talk more interesting things about the total grazing program and the myths that we need to debunk. Thank you and have a great day.